Almost everyone has at least one relationship with one financial institution. Practically all businesses, regardless of industry, require financial services at some point in time, be it credit cards, bank and time deposits, loans, insurance, or investments. But financials go beyond these. It evolves through technology, and rapid innovation has given birth to a long-term trend called fintech or financial technology. Fintech is a powerful trend. Electronic payments are steadily growing with a lot of room to grow exponentially. On top of this, we also have the rise of cryptocurrency and other blockchain technologies. With the Atrium Global Financials Feeder Fund, investors can participate in growth of companies around the world that are involved with providing financial services. The fund gives you access and diversification to global financial names that we normally do not have locally. The fund also invests in fintech, which a normal financials fund would not. Invest in the biggest global companies in the financial industry. Participate in the global recovery. Diversify your investment portfolio by investing in this fund. Invest in the Atram Global Financials Feeder Fund. For more information, visit www.atram.com.ph. The world around us is ever-changing. We are facing development challenges on a global scale. Today, 41 million out of 57 million deaths are attributable to non-communicable diseases. In the Philippines, 5 out of 10 families were deprived of basic education. The Philippines also ranked third in the top 10 countries with the most natural disasters. Women participation in the labor force is less than half at 48%, while male participation is at 77%. The United Nations identified and adopted 17 Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs to address the challenges faced by economies, societies, and the environment. We at ATRAM support the UN and the SDGs by launching the ATRAM Philippines Sustainable Development and Growth Fund. The fund is designed to invest in Philippine companies that score high in terms of the integration of UN SDGs into their operations and strategy. Through this fund, we hope to encourage PSC-listed companies to integrate UN SDGs into their businesses. We must work together to make the world a better place. ATRAM Philippine Sustainable Development and Growth Fund. Invest in a sustainable future together. Invest to thrive. Invest to Together. For more information, visit www.atram.com.ph. Megatrends are shaping and influencing the global economy, urbanization, technological innovation, resource scarcity, and demographic and social change. The long-term shifts in these trends create multiple investment opportunities. They gave rise to a new type of investing called thematic investing. Enter the Atrium Global Equity Opportunity Feeder Fund. The fund invests into the themes that would benefit the most today, making it the first global multi-thematic fund in the Philippine market. Unlike traditional investing, thematic investing is not constrained to sectors or locations, focusing instead on themes and megatrends. It distills the megatrends to find relevant topics that work in this current market environment. It finds the next big thing and invests in it at a very early stage. With this multi-theme fund, investors will have exposure to various companies that will drive future market growth. What's more, you can invest in all the new developments in this world in Philippine Peso or US Dollar, making it accessible to everyone. Invest in the fund that invests in the stories of tomorrow, today. Invest in the Atrium Global Equity Opportunity Feeder Fund. For more information, visit www.atrium.com.ph. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the first episode of this two-part Atrium special webinar series. I am Therese Angangko. I'm an alternatives analyst and I'll be your host for today. So as we all know, COVID-19 pandemic has created a crisis unparalleled in terms of social, economic, and environmental implications, right? Financial and environmental constraints stemming from the pandemic continue to put important structures in peril. So in addition to the immediate human suffering caused by the disease itself, there's also a loss of livelihoods for millions. The COVID-19 pandemic has also stressed several key vulnerabilities of our societal and economic system. And above all, the pandemic has highlighted the importance of our healthcare system, along with it, the investment opportunities in global healthcare, 
given the sector's exciting growth potential. So healthcare presents so many opportunities to invest in companies that are constantly innovating to improve quality of life, to save our lives, really. Um, so we really are excited about that. Um, we at Atram are committed to doing our part in supporting the UN SDGs. So Atram chose three of the 17, uh, namely health and wellness, education, and climate change as our top three SDGs to focus on. And of course, to show our support for these goals um, and how we can help push these goals, we've created even more funds that back sustainable outcomes through the companies we invest in. So stay tuned to know more about this new and exciting fund. So before we begin, I'd like to let you all know that the session will be recorded and that copies will be disseminated as well as posted on all our social media platforms. And don't forget to visit our website, atram.com.ph for a more detailed information about all the funds that we offer, something that suits you. So if you have any friends who you think would like this webinar but can't attend, feel free to share the YouTube replay of the session, visit our YouTube channel, Atram Studio, or you can scan the QR code, take a picture of the QR code to visit our official social media pages. So um, um, we'd also like to, to invite you to join Atram's official Viber community group, hashtag Atram PH community, to stay updated on the latest announcements, advisories, reminders, scan the QR code or visit the link on your screen and get a chance to win Atra merchandise. Ooh, I like that. So we'd also like this webinar to be as interactive as possible. Uh, so please don't hesitate to send in your questions in the Q&A tab um, all throughout the webinar. So each question you send is a raffle entry uh, for a chance to win limited Atra merchandise. So winners will be announced at the end at the end of the webinar. So you have to make sure you stay until the end to um, uh, win your prize. So we'll also be wrapping up with a quick feedback survey after the webinar. So you do, we do hope you can share your thoughts with us on our session today and how we can improve further um, on our webinar series. So without further ado, um, it is indeed a privilege and a pleasure to have with us today, the head of Southeast Asia Wholesale and Insurance, from Fidelity International, Wilden Go. So Wilden leads a team responsible for growing the retail business in Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines, and Indonesia, as well as the insurance business across the region by encompassing product lines, including mutual funds, EDFs, and customized solutions. So Wilden joined Fidelity in 2015 and has accumulated 14 years of experience working in the asset management industry and financial sector. So I'm so excited for him to be with us today. Let's all welcome Wilden. Hi. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A pleasure to be here today. Now, what I'm going to share with you at the beginning are some key statistics that you might be familiar with. Number one, do you know that by 2050, one in five people globally will be age 65 and above? And that means by two thousand in 30 years time, you will have seen 1.5 billion of the world's population in the aging category. Number two, do you also know that healthcare spend on the R&D is actually the largest and the highest in 2020, well above technology? And also, do you know that the middle class consumption will actually, is expected to grow by 29 trillion more by 2030 compared to the current status. Now, what does this statistic mean to you and me? It's basically, these are the key drivers that we have recognized that is driving the healthcare sector. Now, the last 18 months, um, it has been a very challenging environment for you and I. Um, not only has the pandemic impacted the global economy, our livelihood and our personal life, but also it has created immense impact to one sector in particular, and that is the healthcare in both good and bad way. So now let's talk about some bad ways that uh, healthcare has been impacted. And that is really got to do with the stress and strain that this sector has experienced, especially with the rising cases whereby the hospital, doctors, nurses were unable to cope with the sheer volume and amount. Now, however, let's look at the bright side on the good side. Now, the good side is because COVID has become a common enemy globally, and as a result, there has been a concerted and focused 
uh, in dealing with this crisis, which we have seen rapid development in the likes of medical innovation, um, vaccine, uh, tracing of viruses, products and service, so on and so forth. So in other words, pandemic has created both opportunity and risk in healthcare. And for us, we believe it has created more plus than negative. And if you look at the first slide that uh, is showing in front of you here to back up what I've just said, while we recognize that already have been very strong structural drivers pushing at this sector ahead. Now, due to this pandemic, we have also seen globally all the governments stepping up, putting emphasis to make sure that if a similar crisis were to happen, they can actually handle it better. And what better way to do that is to make sure that the healthcare spend will increase. So the example that I've shown you in front of you here is related to the White House, where they unveil a 65 billion pandemic preparedness plan for the next 10 years to in, uh, in order to combat the virus. So what that really shows is, one, this growth of this sector is accelerating, and number two, more opportunity to come. Now, if you look at the next slide, um, one of the areas that uh, we have particular interest and conviction in is actually around the life science tools and services. Now, we, we, we do know that um, healthcare is very global in nature and has multiple value chain from pharmaceutical, biotech, life science, so on and so forth. Now, what makes this uh, subsector very, very interesting and compelling to us are a few reasons. One, we actually do see the business models providing very, very repeatable revenue stream, which means it says margin tends to be more stable. You have a very good flow of income coming in, and which means there will be a long growth runway. Now, number two, uh, although this sector is heavily involved in innovation, but it do not have the binary risk that you often will associate with the likes of biotechnology subsector. Uh, more importantly, if you look at the slide in front of you, before COVID, this subsector has already been one of the best, or if not the best, performing uh, asset class versus your broad US equity or even your broad healthcare. Now, this momentum has actually continued even after the crisis, which means to say that this is definitely an area that has actually stood out and done very well for its own right. Now, why is that so? Perhaps it allow me to give you one example that resides within this life science subsector. A company called Thermo Fisher, which you might be familiar with. Now, Thermo Fisher plays a very, very significant role in this pandemic. So if you look at the early stage of this outbreak, um, what they have done is that they are, that they are, they are able to actually use their uh, proprietary Tenkao Spirit Transmission Electronic Microscope to actually determine and confirm the coronavirus pentagons. So these are important in terms of identifying the virus. Now, as the virus got more and more widespread, Thermo officials PCR test kit was also authorized by the US FDA for emergency use. And today, the test kit is available across more than 180 countries and counting. Now, last but not least, even more recently, um, they have actually supplied Moderna with raw materials for its COVID-19 vaccines and with other services such as field finishings, labeling and packaging in order to aid Moderna in scaling up the production. So you can see Thermo Fisher is just one of many such uh, um, profitable and also innovative companies within the life science subsector. Now, let's take a step back. If you look at the next slide, Let's talk about what's life beyond COVID. Or in fact, if you take COVID aside, is healthcare still investable? As I alluded to at the beginning of my presentation, um, healthcare is a core, a part of our life, and is here to stay. And basically, it is really driven by the three structural drivers. One, the growing and aging population that I alluded to. As you age more, you spend more on healthcare. Two, the growing innovation by the sheer fact that it ranks number one in terms of R&D spend tells you the emphasis on the growth. And last but not least, 
uh, it also plays a very important part in one's portfolio due to its sustainable and defensive characteristic. Now, let me give you a little bit more flavor. If you look at the next slide, what you can see here on your left-hand side is basically the fact and the stats that I mentioned earlier on in terms of the growing population. Now, you might be wondering, so what when we are seeing a spike in terms of aging population? Statistics has also shown that people in that age 65 and above category tends to spend more on healthcare expenses and services and medications. So if you draw the, the relationship between a growing aging population that also equates the huge and growing demand for medical services and medicines. And this really links to the chart on the right, why we are seeing a substantial growth of healthcare spend amongst all the government in the world, which typically rise between 3 to 4% on an annualized basis. Now, in some countries, you will, not, you will even be surprised that healthcare spend today constitute almost up to 20% of their GDP growth. So this really is the key demand for the healthcare sector. Now, also, if you look at the next slide, something interesting has also happened, and that is things are getting more and more complicated. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, probably during our grandfather time, uh, most of the, the, the diseases back then are your likes of pneumonia, are your likes of tuberculosis. People die from those diseases. But today, uh, while they are still around, but they are definitely being well contained and managed. But however, the type of diseases that you and I, or the people around us are contracting are getting more and more complex. And that is got to do with our lifestyle. Diabetes, heart disease, cancers, and all this is really got to do with the way we have been consuming uh, or the way that we have been treating our body that has resulted in all these complications. So which means to say, due to the changes of the new diseases that's popping up, medical technology also needs to be in line and keep up with all the development. And this is why at, uh, on the chart on your right, you can see that clearly in the healthcare sector, R&D span is ranked number one today, even higher than technology. Now, it is very important for us to establish some sort of relationship. So what if you spend on R&D? And that will probably link me to the second point, and that is the next slide, is all about innovation. Now, this is interesting here because we do know that without research and development, you will not be able to produce innovative product and services. Now, without innovation, there's also no way for a company to grow their business. Now, if the company is not able to grow their business, there is no way you can actually see a rise in terms of the share price. So if you and I as investors, if we want to pick a stock that can make money for us, we really have to look out for companies that drive or adapt innovation in their business model because innovation drives growth, growth drives profit, profit drives share prices. Now, Within the innovation, uh, of course, there are two different categories uh, when we look at uh, it within the healthcare sector. One being revolutionary. Now, what do I mean by that is basically things that do not exist 10, 20 years ago. So there are a few classic examples in front of you from the likes of robotic surgery, meaning to say that you can literally be operated by a robot and that robot is being controlled by someone thousand miles away. Also, gene therapy, gene sequencing, uh, well, this is a very interesting development. I often joke with my colleagues that the fortune teller of the world will be out of job soon because uh, in the past, you go to a fortune teller to forecast what potential illnesses or diseases you have. But today, uh, by through gene sequencing, you can actually give you a very, very high probability of the type of illnesses and disease that you might contract in the later stage of your life so that you can take preventive measure to avoid it. Or even to a certain extent, gene therapy allows us to change the DNA within our body in order to cure certain illnesses that has not been able to cure for the last century. So revolutionary 
is actually a very, very key part of the healthcare sector. Now, on the other hand, you will have the evolutionary. So what do I mean by evolutionary? Uh, meaning it says it's an improvement of existing technology. Um, there are many case studies. For example, if you are a diabetic, you used to uh, need to prick your fingers uh, and test the blood to see what is the glucose level. Today, um, there is a certain patch that you can use and put it on your arm for monitoring purpose. Or even in the past, if you have a heart blockage, you probably have to go to the hospital to slice up the chest. But today, you just need to put in a very small valve to actually open up your blood artery. So you can see that there's a lot of development all happening within the healthcare sector, and that is being driven by innovation. Now, if you look at the next slide here, to give you more example, what are the innovative companies? Uh, it ranges uh, from, um, across various areas and verticals. So when we invest, we look out for companies that can deliver proven innovative products that can help generate better outcomes and also cost savings. So some of the example um, within the life science, I've given you Thermo Fisher earlier on. Even within the uh, clinical research organization, companies like IQVIA uh, uses data to speed up the trial process and get drugs to market quicker for the clients. Um, I'm not going to go into details here, but on this slide, I will probably want to uh, address a question that often get asked uh, whenever I talk about innovation in healthcare sector, and that is biotech. Now, I want to give a caveat. Currently, we do have an a, a, a underweight view of the biotechnology subsector, not because we think that it is not a sector that we will be looking at, but the risk reward uh, is currently not in our favor. To give you a few examples, if you do understand how a biotechnology company works is that they basically uh, will be uh, producing uh, innovative or new drugs, right? Now, and especially the smaller biotech company, uh, they often will be focusing on just getting one drug out into the market. Now, that's fine because if they can make it successful, you will probably see the next large and mega cap. But however, if they are not successful, they will go bust and burn. So if you look at the statistic, uh, it is almost like going to a casino to play a big, small game uh, where you have 50-50. But however, the statistic is not even in favor of a 50-50. So to give you some example, if we try to forecast clinical trial readout, it's very difficult because historically, only 7% of drugs make it from the discovery through the phase one, two, three trials, and also to approval. So that means to say that you only have 7% chances of spotting the right one. And that, in fact, increases the risk that one has to take when invest into this subsector. Furthermore, um, historically, through statistics, it has also been proven that while buying into biotech companies, especially the smaller one, will increase the risk of the portfolio, but it doesn't necessarily increase the return. So which means to say, for our stance, we have a preference to be selective within this subsector and buy innovation com innovative companies in the likes of health science. Going to the next point, that, uh, which is the last point, and that is the sustainability and the defensiveness. Now, why is that so? It's because healthcare is a necessity. It is not a one. Um, the, chart in front of you here shows you uh, a few characteristics uh, or, or sorry, a few services that are, are what we call selective services, meaning to say it is not the most urgent need, it is not the most urgent that you need to do it today, but you have to do it one day and you can actually choose your time. So which means to say is that during good and bad times, all these services are still in demand. Now, what does that mean? Uh, that means if you go to the next slide here, it can clearly show you uh, that the return profile of healthcare is highly defensive. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, this is really, uh, I would say, the, a picture says a thousand words because historically, uh, you can see the resiliency of the sector against the broad equity market during downturn because investors tend to rotate to healthcare stocks during 
marked up periods of crisis. And only when the market starts to look rosy, they will rotate the money out to more cyclical area. But if you average out over the long term, the stability, the resiliency, the, and I would say the smoother journey one will get from investing into the healthcare sector is often sought after. To even give you more uh, statistics to back up the defensive nature of healthcare, you can actually look at the next slide. In the next slide, top left-hand corner shows you the profit, uh, profit margin or the earnings expectation of the healthcare sector versus the broad market. True enough, during periods of recession, while the broad markets will see a contraction in terms of earning, but typically you will see that the healthcare sectors remain sound. And the slide on the, and the chart on the bottom left shows you the risk reward that you want that you will be getting versus the broad equity market. And on the chart on the right shows you the drawdown versus the broad market. Now, I would like to emphasize here about the defensiveness and risk of reward because uh, we as investors, sometimes we are focusing just on one matrix and that's return. But it's also critical for us to ask this question, for every risk that we take, is it worth the return? And this is why risk adjusted return is very, very important here because you will want to be on the top left hand side of the chart on the bottom where you get a higher return by taking on a lower risk. And this is exactly what healthcare can do in one's portfolio. Last but not least, in the next slide, you can see that the healthcare sector is actually trading at a very, very attractive valuation versus the other sectors um, globally. So you are not overpaying for a healthy, growing sector with highly defensive characteristics. Now, to end off uh, and to link back to uh, the, the, the topic of the uh, conference today is about securing sustainability. Uh, and this is very, very important to us at Fidelity and more so when it comes to investing in the healthcare sectors. As people live longer and seek to live better, several issues have surfaced, such as providing cost-effective solutions, using innovations to ensure health outcome can be improved, market health care access, making them affordable. This will not only help developing and develop markets, but also globally. So the healthcare sector supports the UN Sustainable Development Goal number three, which is promoting good health and well-being and addresses the issue that's mentioned. Uh, it is also our belief that the better ESG outcome will support the delivery to sustainable growth over time. So how we seek to assess the sustainability of business practices is a commitment to actively engage with companies that we invest in to help Legacy improve on its policies, disclosure, and also the impact to the environment and society. So ESG issues specific to the healthcare sectors uh, could include, for example, product quality, safety, patient data, privacies, and even target relating to climate or broad diversify. So in summary, um, I would like to say that the healthcare sectors definitely remain an extremely exciting space to be invested in. Several short to mid long term factors underpin this. Uh, in the short to medium term, COVID-19 has definitely highlighted enormous pressure on the healthcare system, particularly in parts of the Western world. But that has also increased the importance of innovation to further increase effectiveness. Bear in mind, in the past, it might take many years before a vaccine can be produced. Today, we took less than one year before the vaccine is available. Over the long term, several structural drivers will continue to support the sectors. Aging population, growing population, increasing healthcare needs, rising wealth, uh, and also the change of the type of chronic diseases. And last but not least, the sectors continues to provide not only growth opportunity, but also the defensiveness that one can look for, which is still trading at a reasonable and attractive valuation. So with that, thank you for your time and look forward to speaking more with you.
Thank you so much. Well done for the very insightful discussion on global healthcare. Wow, I learned so much. Definitely, you know, the importance of our healthcare system. Um, just seeing the numbers and seeing that that investing and in in the system is possible, right? Seeing the economics and the actual returns that um, that healthcare investing in healthcare can give us is truly incredible. Thank you so much for showing that to us. Um, and now to give an overview of our newest fund, the Atram Global Healthcare Equity Feeder Fund. We have Atram's pro product development manager, DJ De Jesus. So as a product development manager, DJ identifies potential new product opportunities to continue Atram's legacy of innovation. So hi, DJ, the floor is yours. Thank you, Therese, and thank you, Wilden, for the insights you have given to our audience. This webinar is actually a two-parter webinar, and this is part one, uh, just like how they did it with Dune. Uh, the title of this webinar is Combating the COVID Crisis and Securing Sustainability. And when we were thinking of what funds to launch next, we recognized two themes that we need moving forward from the COVID crisis. Uh, if you think about it, the COVID crisis has two phases. The first phase, the COVID crisis, is a health crisis, which forced us to quarantine, wear masks, and get vaccinated. But the COVID crisis is also a financial crisis, as the lockdowns around the world forced economic activity to go down. This has led people to lose their jobs and businesses to lose revenue. As a health crisis, the developments in the healthcare sector have helped open economies, with the best example being the development of the mRNA vaccines. These vaccines don't even need the actual extracted virus. They don't need the COVID-19 virus, but only the computer code of the COVID-19 virus. This development took 10 years, with the last piece of the puzzle being how to transmit the mRNA to be able to trigger an immune response. But another sector that has been helping combat the crisis is infrastructure. Governments around the world are spending on infrastructure to create new jobs and boost the economy. The $2 trillion Biden plan is the most famous example. What sets Biden's infrastructure plan apart is that it does not only include traditional investments into roads, bridges, public transit, railways, airports, but also sustainable investments such as renewable energy, electric vehicle charging stations, internet services, electric grids, and water infrastructure. So you can see that these investments don't only combat the COVID crisis, but secure the sustainability of the world. Prior to the COVID crisis, to paraphrase the famous activist Greta Thunberg, the world is dying and we need to act now. The way we live their lives has caused two major diseases to be front and center, heart disease and cancer, and one major problem, global warming. In Atom X, we declared our commitment to supporting the United Nations and their sustainable development goals. This is the blueprint to achieve a better and sustainable future for all. At ATRAM, our HR gave us a survey of which three SDGs we would support. We ended up choosing SDG Goal 3, Good Health and Well-Being, SDG Goal 4, Quality Education, and SDG Goal 13, Climate Action. SDG Goal 4 is something we actively work on by providing you with quality investor education through our webinars and events. We launched on February 17 of this year, the Philippine Sustainable Development and Growth Fund, showing our complete support of all the SDGs. But to ad really address the goals that we chose, we decided on two funds, a global healthcare feeder fund and a global infra equity feeder fund. This should encourage investors to support the goals that we also support. These are investments that are future needs 
and it looks like COVID is here to stay. So these investments will help make sure that we continue to fight COVID and secure a better future for us all. Now let me introduce to you the ATRAM Global Healthcare Feeder Fund. And for part two, it would be the ATRAM Global Infra Equity Feeder Fund. The ATRAM Global Healthcare Feeder Fund invests into Fidelity's Global Healthcare Fund. The fund seeks to achieve growth by investing into companies involved in healthcare, medicine, or biotechnology. The fund is perfect for the moderately aggressive investor, someone who's willing to take larger risks for greater potential returns, but less than that of aggressive investments. The fund supports the SDG goal three, good health and well-being. Let me give you our three reasons on why this fund should be the one you would invest in. First, quality. The fund focuses on businesses that are of high quality. And quality here means that they provide handsome but also sustainable growth. Second, defensive. Not only is the healthcare sector a more defensive sector overall, but this fund focuses on minimizing losses and risk. Lastly, sustainable. The fund addresses three major health issues that the world is facing, and we'll discuss that more on that later. We believe in the healthcare sector because of these three reasons. First, there are long-term drivers that will continue to make healthcare relevant, such as an aging developed world, healthcare inflation, and of course, COVID-19. Second, there are exciting new innovations in the space, such as gene therapy, robotic surgery, and genetic sequencing. My favorite innovation is the ability to read our genetic code and find a way to treat parts of the code that would lead to cancer or heart disease, and then treat that. With the developments in healthcare, we could prevent hereditary diseases. Lastly, because healthcare is a defensive sector, the sector is usually up or at least not as down when markets are down. So those are our three reasons for global healthcare. Let's talk about the quality innovation that this fund invests in. Here are some of the examples. First is life sciences and diagnostics. Life sciences focuses on scientific development with physical products such as pharmaceuticals, therapeutics, diagnostics, medical devices, and other products to treat or aid in the treatment of patients. The fund invests into companies like Thermo Fisher that focuses on mass vaccine production. Another area is clinical research organizations, or CROWS. Companies like IQVIA, uh, as Wilden said, runs clinical trials, which helps drugs get to market quicker. And the last example is medical technology. The fund invests into Stryker that develops orthopedic, medical and surgical, and neurotechnology and spine products. As stated, apart from healthcare being already a defensive sector, this fund also minimizes the losses that you would experience from the sector. The way the fund does it is limiting the exposure to small caps and biotechnology. The biotechnology subsector of healthcare is inherently risky because the companies are binary, meaning they either win or they lose. So it, it's really important that if you're selecting within the biotech sector, you have to be highly selective and choose the right companies. And as seen by the graphs, the fund in the light blue has had smaller maximum losses as compared to the healthcare sector benchmark. Lastly, the fund addresses three health issues that are very pervasive in these environments. 12% of the fund invests in companies that provide affordable healthcare access. Managed care companies are a good example, like United Health, as they monitor the cost of treatment for clients. 63% of the fund invests into companies that are working to improve healthcare outcomes. Medical device and biopharma companies are the main focus of this area. 
as I mentioned, Stryker is an example, but you may know AstraZeneca. And AstraZeneca released their COVID vaccine, right? But AstraZeneca is also known for its oncology, which is cancer research, respiratory, and cardiovascular drugs. Lastly, 23% of the fund invests into companies that find cost-effective solutions for healthcare. This focuses on the life science and tools companies, which aids in the research, like Thermo Fisher and IQVIA. Here's just a taste of the top five holdings of this fund. And we already talked about Thermo Fisher and IQVIA and United Health. Roche is an oncology firm, uh, and this one deals with cancer research as well. Danaher is a life sciences conglomerate, which tests vaccines and therapeutics. Overall allocation to the healthcare subsectors is currently mostly equal, with, of course, biotechnology only being around 8.7% of the portfolio. The fund is still mostly invested in the U.S., which is more of a function of the U.S. being a major player in the healthcare innovations. The rest being mostly in Europe, with some investments in Australia, China, and Japan. The target fund has a strong performance track record, providing a growth of 236% since the fund's inception, and an average return of 16% for the past five years. Very strong target fund performance. This fund will be available on Seedbox on December 13 for as low as 1,000 pesos. And that's it for part one, healthcare. Tune in to our social media to find out when we will have part two, infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you so much, DJ. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited for this fund. Wow, I'm so excited, really. Um, but before we move on to our Q&As, uh, Atrium has a wide range of investment products and our capabilities span across several asset classes meant to service the different investment objectives of each individual. So um, it is with great pride that we announced that Atrium has recently achieved nine industry awards for 2021. So the best local fund house in the Philippines given by Asia Investor, the fastest growing fund management company in the Philippines given by the Global Banking and Finance Awards and by the Global Economics Awards, the most innovative mutual fund offerings, again, by the Global Economic Awards, the best investment solution provider from World Business Outlook, and the most innovative asset management company from Pan Finance Awards. And we'd also like to add that Atrium Group and the Atrium Wealth received the Editor's Triple Star from the Asset AAA Sustainable Investing Awards and the Asset AAA Private Capital Awards, respectively, for integrating the ESG, or the Environmental, Social, and Corporate Governance, in our investment process. So finally, uh, the Atrium Total Return PESA Bond Fund has been recognized by the CFA Society Philippines as the best managed fund of the year for PESA medium term FVPL valuation category. So for today's session, we really hope we've assisted you somehow to hashtag take on tomorrow by investing your hard earned money with an award winning fund house. So at this point, um, we'll take in some questions and answers. Um, so we're just gathering that up. Okay. So the first question for you, Will, then, um, sorry, can you just reiterate some of the areas of conviction within the healthcare sector? Sure. Um, I, I guess maybe let me just start off with the areas that we probably do not have much conviction. Uh, <laughs> okay. And then there's a couple of them. Uh, one, right. um, pharmaceutical. Um, the reason why um, we mentioned about pharmaceutical is we believe they are probably a bit slower when it comes to growth. Uh, and they also do experience a couple of headwinds. For example, pricing power, uh, sorry, pricing pressure, uh, patent cleave, uh, which is very common. So normally when you experience patent cleave, what will pharmaceutical company do? They will go out to acquire, acquire um, small biotech companies. And early on during my presentation, you have also heard that uh, finding the right biotech company such that they will get their drugs approved is also very slim, 7%. So with all these headwinds they're facing, and then plus, 
the M&A does not really translate into, I would say, profit margin over the long run, uh, we tend to stay away from pharmaceutical. So this is actually one area that we are kind of underweight. Mm -hmm. Now, the second area, which uh, I've also mentioned, um, biotech, um, because it's like a game of cards, right? 50-50, but it's just that this time around, instead of 50%, you only get 7%. So the odds are actually uh, worse off. But if you really want to play in the biotech segment, there are many ways to go about doing it. One is to buy investing in the value chain. Now, let, let me give you an example. Uh, I've mentioned about life science tools, uh, diagnostics, right? Uh, a lot of these life science company produces raw material for the biotech companies. Uh, and also, they also provide uh, some sort of like a, a, a clinical so-called like trials for these uh, uh, biotech companies. I, I think DJ mentioned uh, Acuvia. This is actually one of those companies. So why, why do I mean by investing the value chain? Is because instead of going and pick the right biotech company that will be successful, why not let's take a step back and pick the raw material provider the equipment provider or even service provider for all these biotech companies to do uh, what they need to do. So in that way, the chances of us picking the right stocks and getting a sustainable and better return will be much, much higher. Now, this analogy is the same when someone comes to me and says, Wilden, uh, I digress a bit. Do you invest in Tesla or BMW? I say, I don't care because I will invest in the battery producer that produce battery to Tesla and BMW. So if you see the analogy here, it makes a lot more sense for us to invest down the value chain. So conviction still remains in the life science sector and less conviction within the pyrotech and as well as pharmaceutical. Hope that answered the question. Yeah, definitely. Oh my goodness. That really is um, brilliant. The way that you're focusing your sectors on is really great. I love it. Um, DJ, would you recommend investing in feeder funds to a new investor who has not invested in local funds yet? What do you think about that? Definitely. Um, so one of the things that you would not really recognize so when you're a first-time investor, especially when looking at the Philippines uh, as, a, as an asset class or investing in the Philippines, is that we are an emerging market. And given that we are an emerging market, yes, there's faster growth. But that also comes with bigger risks as compared to investing into global funds. And feeder funds allow you access to global funds such as uh, the healthcare sector. And as I explained a while ago, when you're investing into the healthcare sector, it's actually one of the more defensive sectors in the market. Uh, meaning when markets are down or when investments are normally down, this is not as down or sometimes even up. Um, and that's the dynamic because people need healthcare. Uh, at the end of the day, healthcare is one of the things that we would regularly need, whether or not there's COVID-19 or not. So being able to invest into a healthcare feeder fund that's invested globally, mostly in the U.S., uh, it's actually a good investment for uh, the first timer. But of course, when we provide um, you know, advice to first timers, it's always one, study really if you understand what you're investing in mm -hmm. and to have conviction in what you're investing in. So if you believe in the story of the healthcare sector and what it's going to be doing and what, how it's going to grow, uh, as Wilden and I explained, then do invest into healthcare. Of course, there are um, vehicles like the, the global allocation and the global equity opportunity that are much more diversified. But if you do believe in the healthcare story, then do invest in this healthcare fund. Yeah, definitely. Um, I was also wondering for beginners or you know, for curious people who aren't so exposed to these types of investments, like how will we know that UITFs are worth investing? Well, UITFs are worth investing because these are um, regulated by the BSP. So right. before we even are able to launch products, the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, our regulator for UITFs, takes a look at the process that we took so that we would be able to choose these investments. Mm -hmm. And um, we're, even after we're launched, uh, the BSP does also regulate the post-management of these uh, feeder funds and UITFs. So uh, for the first-time investor, you can be assured that um, 
our process has been you know vetted by the BSP and mm-hmm. uh, while you know no investment can guarantee you you know gains you know you could still you could still lose from investments you know that uh, w- with Atram we have done the due diligence with regards to selecting these funds yeah definitely thanks DJ well then I was wondering can you talk about some of the opportunities that you see regionally or globally yeah, sure. Um, I, I guess what I've uh, mentioned earlier on are probably some of the opportunities within the subsectors. But a right. common question I often do get asked is, um, well, is healthcare all about US? Um, the answer is no, although <laughs> predominantly right now we do invest in US. And US in terms of, uh, well, this healthcare spend is definitely one of the leader at about 80% of the GDP now. Right. But if you take a, a broader perspective, uh, there are many regions that are up and coming. Uh, for example, China, uh, if you look at the healthcare spend, it's only about, say, 5% of the GDP. Uh, and even if you look at India, it's actually much lesser than 5%. So bearing in mind, these are also the countries that are experiencing the structural growth that we have highlighted earlier on. What do I mean by that? growing population, growing middle class, growing aging population, and they are going to be even more prevalent, even the likes of China. Now, so meaning to say, uh, opportunity within China is something that we are paying close attention, but I do have to highlight at the moment, definitely we are experiencing some sort of volatility as China is going through some sort of structural reform, uh, as we have seen the likes of uh, common prosperity has resulted in the likes of technology crackdown, gaming crackdown. Healthcare sector has not been affected yet, uh, but it has definitely been also uh, affected in terms of the price movement. So while the global investors are wary, while we have seen some sort of sell-off that's happening in China, uh, we believe these are definitely buying opportunities, especially for companies that we believe have very strong structural growth going ahead. So uh, the short answer, Yes, I think China is one area that we should pay close attention to in the future. Definitely. Thank you so much. That's so interesting. I didn't realize that. Um, but I think that's why, again, you guys um, invest in the raw material providers to, uh, you know, um, prevent this uh, vol- that so much volatility happening. Because you never know. Um, and I think uh, investing in the supply chain is really um, a great way to keep it strong. Um, DJ, so how do we invest in the Atram Global Healthcare Equity Feeder Fund? So the Atram Global Healthcare Feeder Fund is going to be available uh, through Seedbox on December 13 for as low as 1,000 pesos. So just visit seedbox.ph and then uh, create your account if you haven't yet. And uh, if you have created your account, just go to the Products tab on December 13 at the very least. You'll see... The Atram Global Healthcare Feeder Fund as one of the options under Atram, and uh, you could invest into the fund for as low as 1,000 pesos. Okay. Oh my gosh. I'm really so excited. So that's two weeks from now. Um, so open your Seedbox account. It's super duper easy. Um, it can take you like 10 minutes. Um, wow. I'm really excited. Um, well done. So how does Fidelity integrate sustainability in the investment process? I know sustainability is like such a hot topic right now and it's so important. So how does Fidelity do it? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And it also depends on which camp you are in because I do have clients uh, coming to me and says, well then, uh, all I want is return. Uh, you know, as long as you give me the yeah. best return, it is sustainability important. is not important. But however, I I beg to differ. Well, there's some truth to that statement. But if you dig deeper, uh, the truth actually tells us that by investing into companies with strong sustainable characteristics has often resulted in better share prices. Okay, so how how we have actually integrated that into our process, I think there are two things that really stood up for us at Fidelity. Uh, One, leveraging on our DNA, which is, one of which whereby we have one of the largest uh, pool of analysts or we have more than 200 of us covering, I would say, 90% of the global stocks and bonds. Okay, mm-hmm. So that gives us very good insights to the companies having long-term relationship with them. And as a result, what we have done so is instead of also, instead of evaluating the company based on their fundamental, we have also evaluated them based on their sustainable characteristics, which means to say we do give an ESG rating to each and every company that we cover. Okay, now 
uh, this proprietary fidelity rating, how does it differ with, let's say, MSCI sustainable rating where most people are more familiar with? While it's great that you have provider like MSCI giving you sustainable rating, but this typically tends to be backward looking, meaning to say what the company has done well in the past. Now for us, we believe we should focus on what the company will do in the future because you want to participate in the rate of change. You want to influence them in order to get the better upside. So that leads me to my second point, influencing, which means engagement is actually the core of our sustainability process. We believe not just about excluding things that we do not like, but we want to make the world a better place. We would like to influence the companies that we invest in so that they can also take in our uh, advice and collectively we can actually create a better outcome, especially on the sustainable side. So uh, 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 a short answer to, to your question, how we have really integrated uh, and made it unique to us is about having our proprietary ESG rating on a forward-looking basis mm -hmm. and using our strength and size to influence and engage companies that we invest in so that we can create a better world. Thank well you. done. Um, with, the, uh, with this engagement, we really see with the uh, fund, right, that it's able to address certain issues about health, like affordable access, improving outcomes, and cost-effective solutions, which uh, really addresses the, the needs for healthcare sustainability. Yes, DJ, uh, absolutely. Um, as I mentioned early on in my presentation, uh, we are very aligned on this, uh, especially on the SDG goal number three. Uh, making sure that the companies that we invest in are all aligned with that goal. Um, and I can give an example uh, of uh, uh, making changes uh, with a company called Baxter, uh, where we were heavily involved in the entire process, where we actually reach out to the management with a topic that we would like to see change. And throughout the last, I would say, uh, uh, months and years, we have been participating in numerous of their stakeholder management uh, meetings uh, and conferences. Uh, and not only that, we want to make sure that we are able to also track the progress. So it's not about, here's my problem statement and I think you should make a change, but we are actually involved in that process. So of course, things are definitely still work in progress, but this is one of many examples that we can actually showcase to our investors that our engagement has often resulted in a more ideal outcome rather than exclusion. Right, thank you so much. That's a brilliant answer. Um, but another question, what will happen to the fund um, if once COVID is gone, right? How will the healthcare fund survive? Like, what do you think? Well, the, sorry, there's a lot of questions in one question. Uh, what are their plans to have, you know, a good return of investment once COVID disappears? I think we're all wondering that as well. Yeah, I, 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 I think we, we are very fixated with COVID. Um, yeah. But if you take COVID aside, um, there are certain structural trends that are here to stay. Um, mm -hmm. The population need I mentioned about how people who age would require more um, healthcare services and medication. Right. So that yeah. is a growing trend that will not go away. Even the likes of China has realized that and now trying to implement like the two child policies, for example. Uh, and then number two, uh, even before COVID arrives, uh, you can see that the amount of money being spent on R&D in the healthcare sector is one of the top, if not the top. And then the third is um, there are many type of uh, healthcare services uh, that uh, is not no longer a need, uh, sorry, it's no longer a one, but a necessity. So right. we, we have to start to realize the relationship. Uh, this is not a luxurious good segment where well, if I have money, I'll spend. Uh, it's actually a segment that we have to use or utilize it for our day-to-day -day survival. So um, in short, the long-term structural trends that I've mentioned that will keep things going, uh, all I can say is COVID accelerated this whole process and make uh, the whole R&D and healthcare sector a focus, which we believe will have more tailwind uh, to support it in the short to medium term going forward. Right. Okay. I could add. Um, yeah. I think the COVID nineteen, you know, pandemic or the crisis that we're undergoing right now, um, it's still evolving. Uh, we don't know the bookend to that story yet. Uh, just you know, last week we got news of the new variant from South Africa called the Omicron, right? And 
we always thought that, hey, with all the vaccines and uh, the approach of trying to, you know, fight off COVID-19 and remove it completely, uh, as much as we thought that we're successful, uh, with a lot of people still not taking the vaccines and uh, there are people that are still able to spread the virus, uh, it's clear that COVID-19 has an ability to stay. And um, me nerding out, I actually studied what kind of um, virus the COVID-19, it's a coronavirus, right? Uh, which is actually a, a relative of the common cold. And, you know, we've tried to find, you know, cures for the com common cold. And we've definitely prevented the common cold from being, you know, something that's uh, a burden. But at the same time, um, until that time, healthcare will be uh, a topic that would remain. Um, just to add to the aging population, that's increasing the demand for healthcare. And because of this increased demand for healthcare, we're seeing a lot of inflation within health, the healthcare space. And it's really innovations to be able to lower those costs that is going to continue to drive healthcare to have strong ROIs moving forward. Yeah, thank you. Definitely, um, health, the healthcare sector is so robust um, and we'll always need it. Um, what do you think has been the three-year average market return of the healthcare sector? Well, if I look at the last three years, I think on average, on the analyze uh, basis, mm -hmm. it's about 16%. Um, um, and if I look even the, on the longer perspective for 10 years, I think if I'm not wrong, it's also about 15%. So yeah. mid-teens return for both last three years and 10 years, that's probably the return profile uh, that we have been seeing uh, for this healthcare sector. Yeah, thank you. That is, that is really good, actually. Um, um, it's really incredible like what this healthcare uh, fund can do for our healthcare system. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, DJ, knowing that the Atrium Global Healthcare Equity Feeder Fund is just quite new in our market compared to the other funds. Like how can we have conviction in this fund? Well, you've already seen the power of healthcare and of course this fund as well. Um, if you just look at the returns, 15% for the past three years, 15% mm -hmm. for the past 10 years, this fund has done 16% uh, in the past five years uh, on an annualized basis. You could see that this fund really is able to perform really well. Um, also, the fund itself ma minimizes the losses that you've, uh, you could encounter even within this sector. So, uh, and that's one of the points that I provided a while ago. But the thing that really drives healthcare and why it's important is, you know, it's something we could relate to. Um, more than just COVID-19, and I mentioned this a while ago, one of the, or two of the big things that we're still trying to find cures for, and we're still looking for, um, you know, how to treat it is really cardiovascular disease or heart disease and uh, oncology, uh, what's that? Cancer. And yeah. these two, yeah, there's a lot of strides that's being developed within this space. It's, two of the more prevalent um, diseases that we're still fighting today more than just COVID-19. You know, if you look at the complications of people who died from COVID-19, it's really people with comorbidities. Either uh, they already have heart disease or they have liver disease. And it's really built upon how, you know, our lifestyle has evolved throughout. And why you want to have conviction in healthcare is you want to be able to combat that. You want to be able to fight all these, you know, existing problems that are still, you know, getting developments. We're still at the early stages, even with COVID-19, even with all the vaccines, there's really going to be still more growth on how that's going to be brought um, and transmitted and uh, distributed. So healthcare is something we need uh, that's why doctors get so much money, right? <laughs> uh, so clearly, uh, healthcare is something that will stay. COVID-19, you know, uh, to quote Wilden, was boosted it, uh, boosted and supercharged uh, the need for healthcare. But at the end of the day, healthcare and 
the innovations that are ongoing on the space, especially on cancer research, especially on heart disease uh, research, is something that will continue to provide returns for clients. Mm-hmm, definitely. Thank you so much, DJ. I think that's all the time we have now for questions. Oh my goodness, so sorry. We went a bit over time, but this healthcare is just too interesting and too exciting um, to talk about. So before we wrap up, any last words, Wilden? Um, I think it's key to stay invested uh, because over the long run, you will be well rewarded. <laughs> yes, definitely. What about you, DJ? Uh, to keep it short, the, the name of the webinar is Combating the COVID Crisis and Securing Sustainability. Uh, it's a two-part title. It's a very long title. But let's uh, focus on the last part. It's not just COVID-19 that we're fighting. We're fighting for our lives. We're fighting for our sustainability. And uh, healthcare is really one of those sectors that would help. And please tune in to part two for this. It's not just one sector that... Uh, you know, answers this cry of sustainability. We have another uh, fund upcoming and uh, tune in to our social media to find out about the Infra Equity Feeder Fund. And of course, invest into the Global Healthcare Equity uh, Healthcare Feeder Fund that will be available on Seedbox for as low as 1,000 pesos on December 13th. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much again, Wilden and DJ. We super appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Um, as well as our audience, thank you so much for sticking with us. Uh, I hope you learned a lot about investing in the healthcare system. And we hope you're able to gain the key insights and takeaways from today's webinar. So I'm sure you guys are interested to know about how to invest in the Actrum Global Healthcare Equity Feature Fund. So please stay tuned to know more. Hello. To open an account with Atrum. Just visit our website at www.atrum.com.ph. Here, you can learn more about all the funds and services that we offer. Our site will then guide you to our online investment platform, Seedbox, where you can start investing for just 1,000 pesos. But if you have more questions, visit the website's Frequently Asked Questions page or Atrum Academy page. Thank you. See, oh my God, it's so easy um, to sign up for Seedbox. Um, Don't forget that it will be available on December 13. So make sure to mark your calendars. That's two weeks from now. So if you have any further questions or would like to learn more about Atrum, please visit our website, atrum.com.ph. And you can also join our Viber community um, to learn all the updates there. On behalf of everyone at Atrum, thank you again for your attendance and participation. And we wish you and your loved ones continued health and safety. So have a great day. Thank you so much.